Some just like to see the sunset reflect on its surface. If one's fishing it. Hey, Mel, look at him. I've got the behemoth. And skim on its surface. Others are curious about what can be under the surface. But one of the most perplexing mysteries of the lake are stories of a lake monster told by credible eyewitnesses. Sightings of this creature go back as far as the original native Indians that once lived along the Erie shores. The Native American Indians that once lived along the lake shores have always claimed that this aquatic monster lurks in Lake Erie. They describe it as being covered in fish scales and slithers like a snake on the surface of the water and is able to move up rivers in search for food. But the natives also claim that it could also creep onto land using its large flipper-like appendages. Other witnesses have reported that it's about 30 to 40 feet long and has a terrible odor. Lake Erie was the last lake out of all the Great Lakes to be discovered because of some of the violent Indian tribes that lived around the lake. It was founded by a French explorer in 1615. During the French and Indian War in the mid-18th century, Great Britain took control of the lake. But in 1812, Americans took over ownership of Lake Erie because of a naval victory defeat over Great Britain. One of the oldest recorded sightings of this creature was in 1793. It was from a captain of a ship named the Felicity, which was docked at Middle Bass Island during the incident. And uh, he was hunting for some ducks, and um, he shot at a few of them, and um, he woke in something up in the high grass that came out and chased him. He had to run for his life, He's, uh, he, you know. So that's the first recorded of something strange happening in that area, of a creature that weeks a day called the Gary Monster. One of the earliest and other early sightings was in 1817 in the Erie Township of Ottawa County, not far from Toledo, Ohio. Uh, two French settlers saw a huge monster squirming in agony on the beach. And uh, they went to back to get um, some more help and to get the rope and pull this creature back up further. But when they came back, the creature was gone. The creature was gone. But they found these scales that you know looked like about a half a dollar size scale. Lake Erie Sea Serpent reports in the 1800s were more frequent than monster sightings on land. Even though over time less and less land monster stories were reported, while lake monster sightings increased. The Cleveland Register in 1818 
said that every summer for the past three years there have been sightings of a terrifying sea serpent in different parts of the lake. One witness, a lake sailor, who testified he had seen the monster more than once, said the serpent is so large its head and tail stick out of the water as much as 30 feet. Around that same period, an enterprise artist put together all the details he could from witnesses and painted a composite that was something of a sensation. It was on display for a long time in downtown Cleveland at the Museum of Wax Figures. It drew large crowds who would study it with bulging, disbelieving eyes for hours. A report in the Fort Covington Sun News in New York told of a sighting in the early morning hours on July 13, 1892 of a giant sea serpent. A schooner was on its way from Buffalo, New York to Toledo, Ohio when the captain and his crew saw a 50 foot long sea monster with a 4 foot circumference thrashing in the water half a mile ahead of them. It soon quieted down and laid in full length on the surface of the water. Its head projected 4 feet out of the water which they described as terrible looking. It had viciously sparkling eyes and a large head, along with large flipper-like appendages. It eventually headed out to deeper water. A published report in 1909, written in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, about a group of Union salt workers claimed that they watched for some time a giant snake churning up the water on the surface for several minutes before eventually moving off towards the direction of Euclid Beach. One of the most alarming stories came in 1912 from an ex-mayor of Millen, Ohio. And he said he was strolling along the Huron River and he claims he witnessed a sea serpent, some kind of a monster, come out of the water uh, and eat a sheepdog and a groundhog. And uh, he went off and reported it. And uh, the people in the county were scared. They were farmers. And they, uh, they formed a posse with several weapons, whatever they could think of. And there was a long search along the Huron River of this creature that this ex-mayor saw. But nothing was ever reported being found. The lake consists of three basins, the west, central, and eastern. The western basin is the shallowest with the depth of only 30 feet. The central basin is the largest of all the basins with a depth of approximately 60 feet. This area of the lake has a very narrow bottom, which causes a deficiency in oxygen. The deepest part of the lake is the eastern basin, with a depth of 210 feet. Lake Erie covers 9,910 miles and is almost evenly divided between the U.S. and Canada. Lake Erie's main source of water comes from the Detroit River, 
which delivers water from Lake Huron, while the main outflow of Lake Erie is the Niagara River. After passing over Niagara Falls, Lake Erie's water empties into Lake Ontario. The Welland Canal acts as the lake's lesser outflow, which diverts water for ships passing from Port Colborne, Ontario, on Lake Erie, to St. Catharines on Lake Ontario. <laughs> on July 10th, 1934, a gentleman, along with five other bathers, when they saw what they thought was a dog's head sticking out of the water. As they waited out a little to get a closer look, they decided it must be a seal, not a dog. Then, to their horror, they realized that it was a 20-foot long sea monster. Witnesses described it as having a body shaped like a man's leg and a head like a dog. After watching it for 15 minutes, it headed out to deeper water. The sightings have continued throughout the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. And, into, and they continued into the 60s. Uh, some were reported, many were not, for the sake of being ridiculed. There were, in, in 1960, there was a fisherman over by Sandusky. A gentleman was fishing up a pier, and he, and he decided, hey, there's a couple of rats over there. I can throw a rock at it. So he threw a rock at it, and it, this creature just rose up, had flippers, looked at him, and turned around and went back out into the lake. Well, the Lake Erie is only uh, about 60 feet deep. And uh, that makes it very, um, it can create what's known as uh, rogue waves. A lake that's shallow can present various hazards in navigation. And also, because of the lake being the shallowest, it doesn't take much of a storm for Lake Erie waves to act up. There have been mysterious waves as high as 15 feet high. Appearing out of nowhere and crashing onto the shores of Lake Erie. Washing away people and heavy structures along with depositing huge barges and large tree trunks on dry land. Well, the thing about the lake is it can turn on a dime. If you're out there, you gotta pay attention to the weather, to the boats, you know, what's going on. Because I'll tell you, that lake is, because it is shallow, it can turn fast on you, it can kill you. But there has been some unexplained disappearances of ships over the years that some contribute to something more than just a siege. Since no winds or storms were reported during the time of these mysterious vanishings. Large working reliable ships that would suddenly disappear from the surface of the lake were never to be found. One ship, a schooner, named South America, vanished in 1843 on November 4th, making it the most well-reported disaster of that season. 
Captain Brady left Buffalo, New York with a full crew along with a cargo of salt for Toledo, Ohio, never to be seen again. In 1942, there was another ship on December 2nd that disappeared mysteriously, the Admiral. It was a tugboat towing a tanker barge called the Clevco, carrying one million gallons of crude oil from the Maumee River's marine terminal onto Lake Erie at sunset and sailed east towards Cleveland. Uh, the barge that it was pulling it was reported by the captain that the rope that was pulling the barge was pointing down into the dark waters instead of straight out. Somehow this barge sank with the rope still taut. Shortly after sending out an SOS to the Coast Guard, they lost all contact with this tanker and the barge. It just, it just, uh, the Admiral just disappeared. On December 7th, 1909, the railroad car ferry, the Marquette and Bessemer, also known as number two, sailed out into Lake Erie. It carried 26 railroad cars and their cargo weighing more than 30 tons each. The ship disappeared between Port Stanley, Ontario in Conneaut, Ohio. Witnesses that lived along the north and south side of the lake heard the ship's distress whistles that night but could not see the ship nor its lights. A few days later, a single lifeboat was discovered along with the bodies of the crew members, and they were all frozen to death. They were all frozen in place. Uh, like they, they just froze right where they sat in this life raft. All nine men were frozen in their seats, along with the ship's cook, who was carrying two long galley knives and a meat cleaver, as if trying to defend itself from an unseen foe. A man's clothes laid at the bottom of the boat indicating that there were originally 10 men in the lifeboat when it was boarded. Another tugboat named the Sackham in 1950 mysteriously disappeared on December 18th. While well, returning from Buffalo, New York, after delivering a dredger. The winds were reported 14 miles per hour and the water was calm. And it just disappeared. The Sackham was even seen by another captain of a ship before it mysteriously disappeared. And this captain of the steamer said that there was no signals, there was no sign that it was in distress. Now whether these disappearance of the ships, of these ships, are the cause of uh, this Lake Erie monster, as some predict, uh, it is unknown. Uh, sightings have continued throughout the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and, into, and they continued into the 60s. Uh, some were reported, many were not for the sake of being ridiculed. There were, in, in 1960 there was a fisherman over by Sandusky 
a gentleman went fishing up a pier, and he, and he decided, hey, there's a couple of rats over there. I can throw a rock at it. So he threw a rock at it, and it, this creature just rose up, had flippers, looked at him, and turned around and went back out into the lake. Cleveland, uh, Lake Erie, uh, had, at one point had a, it was a butt of the jokes that it was a, a lake that was practically dead. The other thing is, uh, um, it was the butt of a lot of jokes on, on uh, Saturday Night Live and uh, even in Dr. Seuss Bell's books they wrote about how bad this lake was. And, uh, but mainly the river was what was really the catching fire. Come on, that's a way. That's water. Yeah, it was it was a, for the longest time people there were, you couldn't fish out of there, you couldn't eat anything out of there. It was just so polluted. Some wonder if the pollution that has been deposited in the lake by the surrounding rivers over the years could have caused a mutated monster. By 1970, the Cuyahoga River had a reputation for catching fire because of all the untreated chemical waste that has been deposited into the river by surrounding factories. Also, in 1970, Lake Erie was legally declared biologically dead because of all the pollution. Only the algae and various scavengers could survive the dreadful environment. Scientists also warn the public today about dangers of consuming fish out of the lake because of the high toxic levels of mercury found in the aquatic life. Reference to the poor condition of Lake Erie can also be found mentioned in a Dr. Seuss book and TV show titled the Lorax. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. I hear things are just as bad up in Lake Erie. Just fish out of water on hot dry land. People and some believe that maybe this pollution in the 70s uh, created some kind of a mutant creature, uh, which is what people have been seeing because of uh, the untreated chemical waste that has been deposited into the rivers by surrounding factories over the years, especially Cuyahoga River. <laughs> Cuyahoga River has been known to catch on fire. It was so polluted by toxic, by uh, chemical uh, toxic waste from these plants. Because of the Clean Water Act that was created in 1972, Lake Erie had a celebrated comeback. By 1980, with the return of all the popular game fish to the lake, Lake Erie once again attracted tourists and fishermen alike. One of the many sightings in 1985 was from a Lorraine, Ohio man. While boating in the lake just off the Coast Guard station, 
He reported seeing a monster with three large black humps rising up out of the water for about three to four minutes before submerging again into the calm waters. He claims it was twice the size of a 16-foot boat. Also around that same period, a creature matching the same description was spotted by two gentlemen from Akron, Ohio, just north of Vermilion, Ohio. In 1989, there was a trip out on the water, and uh, they had uh, they were working with their sonar, and the sonar saw, saw a image that was uh, kind of like cigar shape. This thing was 35 feet long, and 30 feet below the water, and they tracked it for a little bit you know, on the sonar. And uh, it disappeared. A gentleman said something bumped his fishing boat, a Boston whaler, while anchored one night just off of Vermilion. He said he sprang up to the deck and grabbed his lantern to see what it was. As he held the light over the water to have a look, he was able to see a 20 foot long thick creature just a few feet beneath the keel of his boat. It darted away with incredible speed, about 30 feet from the boat, before rearing its serpentine body out of the lake. and it had a huge head. He looked at him, and they looked at each other, and then he took off, the creature took off. He said, this guy said, man, I'm never sleeping again on a lake by myself. <laughs> that would get my attention. After turning and looking straight at him, it disappeared back into the inky black water. Scientists over the years have weighed in on what the locals are seeing or what the creature could be. Many can't believe that a dinosaur-sized reptile could be living in Lake Erie and that it would have to eat up all the large fish in a 200 square mile area just to survive. So some of the stories that they've uh, believed that it could be would be a crazed carp. Uh, carp can get pretty big. Uh, they, can, they can weigh close to 100 pounds or more. Uh, and they're a ferocious fighter if you catch them online. And other uh, scientists think it may be would be uh, uh, a sturgeon which goes back to this prehistoric days. And uh, they're usually bottom feeders, but when they do surface, they can, their texture can look like the texture of a dinosaur. This unknown creature has been spotted in the lake from Canada all the way to Pennsylvania by a variety of different people. Most of the sightings seem to be when the lake is eerily calm. The fame of the monster has been printed in various newspapers all over the world. It's been reported in various newspapers from time to time of reports of this creature. It's been reported as far away as Northern Ireland and uh, Japan.
In 1990, the poor Clinton Beacon decided to run a contest of what to name this creature. Thought that maybe this was like a contributing factor to some of what they've been seeing. So they named this creature the Bessie. They decided to name this creature itself Bay Bessie after the nuclear plant. And uh, because, they, because of all the radiation and you know, all the, not so much radiation, but the water could be really hot. You know, when it cools, they bring this water out to be cooled. There's a big, the heat from that cre created a, a creature, you know, that became mutant as a result of all the, some of the contamination that was spread through that part of the lake. The sightings continued into the 90s when a tourist from Florida in 1990 was jet skiing off of Port Clinton in Lake Erie. When he saw what he believed was an aquatic air breathing creature with humps rising up out of the water. As he approached it, it went down. He didn't think too much of it when he reported it thinking that it was not unusual for a large ocean fish to sometimes find their way up into the Great Lakes region. Later that same year, on September 11th, two firefighters, viewed from their three-story window looking out over Lake Erie, a dark blue serpent with three humps about 30 to 45 feet long laying still above the water for three to six minutes before submerging. There it is! Weekly World Newspaper, August 24th, 1993, also ran on the front page a story of a, of a 38 foot sea serpent that attacked a sailboat with a family on board. And uh, there on the front page of the paper, they had a sea serpent, you know, sinking a sailboat which they claim was actually photographed by a helicopter flying overhead. And even though that has been proved to be altered and fake, uh, it does seem to be some kind of report in the records uh, of, a, of a sailboat that sank because of something that came up out of the lake. Do sea serpents still exist? According to science, these giant reptiles lapsed into extinction some 65 million years ago.
still. Occasional reports from credible witnesses have kept the issue alive. I would say that uh, the Lake Erie Monster has always been a curiosity in, in, uh, in, this, in, this, in, the, in the history of the lake goes back as far back as uh, the American Indians and the early settlers have reported seeing the Lake Erie Monster, mainly over by Sandusky in that area. And it's been, it's, uh, it's been as big as uh, 40 feet long. Some people think that the uh, Lake Erie Monster is uh, something from a prehistoric past. The prehistoric yeah, fish they found in the uh, over by Rocky River um, Terminal Center, they have a, a, a skeleton of what's called a duckle, duckle orus. It's a, another name for it. It's a terrible fish. <laughs> it's a big fish. It's about, well, it's about uh, 30 feet long, weighs about four tons. And it's got um, big teeth. Now, some speculate, could a fish like this be still living in Lake Erie? Is this what the people are seeing? Since one of the description was a bottle nose, uh, head, uh, cylinder body. This thing was designed to eat other sharks. It's, it's, you have to see it's blue. It's a big fish. It's about the size of a small BW. It probably could swallow that thing. Scientific investigation of lake serpents is not quite a respectable enterprise, which is plagued with inadequate resources. Few scientists are willing to risk their reputation and career associating themselves with monster hunts. This is mainly why we know so little information about these creatures. Well, these days, uh, Lake Erie is a very popular place, place for uh, fishermen. Fishermen come from all over the place for fishing. Well, what makes this place a popular place is just food. The more food, the more the fish eat, the bigger they get, the more prized they are for fishermen. One of the reasons for the success of Lake Erie is the farms that surround Lake Erie. The chemicals that are used on crops that accidentally work their way into the stream, which then work their way out to the lake, and they cause algae. And algae is what fish feed on. And algae is great. And algae, you know, if you want a healthy lake. But the problem with too much of one thing uh, can cause problems. It's like steroids. Some, you know, it's like taking steroids. But too much of steroids, it's going to kill you. Or it's going to turn you into something that you don't want. In 1972, the Clean Water Act cleaned up a lot of the problems that were existing at the time. But today, we have another problem. That is, all the phosphate running off the farmland, especially up in, uh, by Sandusky in that area. In fact, if you look at the lake, there is a, a white line that goes right along the whole lake. That's phosphate. So, it, and it, we have a lot of algae, but 
too much algae is not good. It's actually toxic. By 2011, Lake Erie Western Shores became totally green from algae, spreading all the way east to the Cleveland Harbor and stretching 10 to 12 miles offshore. The phosphate is being released into the lake, which is creating a, um, an algae situation, which is in and of itself is not bad, but too much of a good thing is not good. And uh, that's why a couple of years ago, the, the water was, uh, they couldn't drink it. They had to bring in bottled water and stuff until they got, they're still working on that problem, trying to have the farmers use less phosphate. The 2010 algae problem became two and a half times worse than the lake's algae problem in the 1960s. Reports were made of people who were swimming or fishing in the lake experienced side effects, such as skin rashes. The Detroit River also contributes by dumping 30 billion gallons of raw sewage that come from the Michigan sewer plants. Adding to the problem, Maumee River drops phosphates into the lake because of their dredging operations. Today's sewage treatment plants, combined with sewer overflow, have untreated runoffs into the lake when a heavy storm drops too much rain over the plant's capacity. They found the problem and solved the problem of, of pollution, uh, of the factory waste. Uh, from the factories along the Cuyahoga River and, 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 and from the city of Detroit, um, but nothing was done about this algae, about uh, that was these runoffs from the farms. There is something that is in the lake that people are seeing. Uh, there's some big things out there. There's some big things out there. You know, we don't know everything. We, we you know, they spot a fish that they thought were dead, prehistoric stuff. But they thought we're dead. Just because, you know, yeah, anything's possible. Dead. Yeah, there was a, a case where they brought this fish up uh, that was, so, was pretty deep. And they thought it was, it was extinct, and they, here it is, you know, they, right in front of them. That the fish, yeah, they, they found fish that they thought were gone. So anything's possible. You can't exclude anything.
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, how cute. <laughs> Cutie pie. 
Oh, <laughs> 